Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the Engineering Future Podcast. I'm your host, Luis Duque, and this week, I bring a conversation with Stephanie Slotman. She is a structural engineer that recently started her own company about two years ago, and, and she's helping other women in engineering, as well as just creating a lot of great content around engineering. She has a lot of programs, a lot of classes that she's putting out there, a lot of information to help young engineers, and more specifically, women in engineering succeed in their careers. She wrote She Engineers, which is a book about helping other women in engineering succeed in their careers, and we'll get a little bit more on this episode. So if you are someone that is starting their careers, and even if you're not a woman in engineering, you're going to take a lot of value in this episode because we talk about some of the things that young engineers should be doing in their careers and how the entrepreneur, entrepreneurial mindset will help us have a better career in, engin- in engineering, even if we don't want to start our own business. So stay tuned for this episode. I'm very happy to get to know Stephanie a little more. As I said, we've been collaborating a few things through comedies and just uh, on social media, and, and we kind of been around each other for a little while, but it was great to sit with her and learn more about all the things that she's doing. So before we start today's episode, let me tell you about... So before we start today's episode, let me tell you about PPI. PPI is one of the best resources on the internet to study for the FE, the the PE, and the SE exams. They have a lot of resources, a lot of practice problems, practice questions, practice exams, uh, books, courses, and all these things that will help you pass your exam guarantee. I personally am I'm currently studying for the PE to be to take it here in April. And I'm going to be using some of the resources to help me pass my exam. So if you go to ppi2pass.com slash duke, you can get 15% discount on their products. That's ppi2pass.com slash duke. The second sponsor for this episode is Audible. Audible has one of the biggest libraries in terms of audiobooks, podcasts, stories, and a lot more beyond audiobooks. And it's been great to work with them. They have a lot of resources and a lot of great audiobooks that have been taken advantage of. And you can actually find Stephanie's book, She Engineers and Audible. If you go to audibletrial.com slash engineeringourfuture, you can get a free month plus a book so you can enjoy Stephanie's book and, and learn more about all the great things that she has to share in this book. Remember, go to audibletrial.com slash engineeringourfuture. A free month of Audible premium as well as a free audiobook for you to enjoy so without further ado let's jump right into today's content welcome to engineering our future podcast a podcast where i bring you relevant content from personal experience and guests to help young engineers students and international students succeed in their careers Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the Engineering Future Podcast. Today, I have Stephanie Slocum. She is a structural engineer turned entrepreneur, and I just wanted to bring her to the podcast and just learn all the things that she's doing. Uh, as you heard in the interview, she's had a very su- successful career, and there's a lot to learn from her. So, Stephanie, do you want to give us a brief introduction and some of the things you're doing in your career right now? Uh, yeah, I'd love to. Thanks. And th- first, thanks for having me on on the podcast. Uh, so as you said, my uh, background is in structural engineering. I spent 15 years uh, kind of working my way up from EIT to associate principal. Uh, and then two years ago, I founded my own company, Engineers Rising LLC. We are a career and leadership development company for engineers with a special focus on women in engineering. Um, And so today, like I essentially get to be a full-time engineering mentor. Uh, So I like to say I have the best job in the entire world because I get to inspire inspire and encourage and empower uh, engineers. Um, But the, the road here was not a straightforward path. It was a little bit rocky. Um, And I had a lot of like doubts and, um, you know, confidence issues and, like was never the person that was like, oh, I'm gonna start my own company. Like that was never my dream. Uh, So I'm excited today to share a lot of kind of my journey, what I learned the hard way with your listeners, uh, partially so they know that like when you're having doubts in your own career path, uh, whether they be, you know, you're a student in school trying to figure out what your engineering major is, a young professional, a mid-career person, like you are not alone in that. And also to share some like tips and strategies that you can use to get you know, from where you are right now, which may be feeling like a little bit stuck to where, where you want to go. Yeah, that's awesome. And 
we connected, I think, two years ago, right before the Structures Congress. We just kind of were in a couple emails, kind of back and forth, and connecting on LinkedIn. And uh, I remember just looking you up and seeing that you have a book, you have your own company, you have all these great things, your coaching program and everything, kind of empowering women in engineering, which is a, it's a very important mission, not only for women, but for men also in engineering. And I'm just kind of curious what motivated you to write your book. I listened, it, listened to it as soon as I met you online and I was blown away by the quality of the book, not only for women, but I think it's a book that is really relevant for men to realize that there may be some, some biases that we have in our way of acting that it may seem normal to us, but it's, it's not normal. And I was fascinated with the book and it was a, an amazing book to read. So what was kind of the motivation behind writing the book? Okay, so I have to like take you back to one of my various like career sticking points uh, in that I had hit a, a point where I felt like I was looking for something more, but I didn't know what that more was. Like I liked the technical aspects of my job. I was in kind of a project management role, um, but I also really kind of enjoyed the mentoring aspect of like helping other engineers sharing knowledge and all of that sort of thing um, at the same time like i've always had a skill for writing uh, and so when i started looking around as okay like you know what else can i do to stretch and grow and learn more skills um, writing a book came up as something i actually had always wanted to do but never gotten around to doing it i think we all have these things on our lists don't we yeah. we have we have dreams in our head that we're like i'll do that someday but then if we don't make a plan to do it it never actually happens well in this case the universe like hit me on the head a couple times um i i went to a conference where i met someone who knew someone else uh, who ran a self-publishing school of all things who knew how to how to publish books um, and then, so I have three children and about two weeks after that happened, my oldest daughter was in her second grade class and she, they were doing a book writing pro project and it came up that I had always wanted to write a book. We were just talking about it over dinner one night and I'm like, this is weird. This book thing keeps on coming up. <laughs> uh, and so I'm like, you know, maybe, maybe this is the thing I need to do is, is take all these things I've learned put them into a book, put the stories, put all the, the research I had done over uh, several years trying to figure out like what I was missing in my own career. Um, and that all went into She Engineers. Uh, for listeners that, that have never heard of this book, this is the first time, uh, it's essentially like the, the non-technical stuff you need to be successful, particularly as a, a woman in engineering. And it's, it's not at all, like there's a lot of books out there that are a social commentary on the state of women, minorities, and engineering. This is very much a, if you're in this spot, like you're the only one in the room, how do you figure out what to do? How do you figure out how to get like unstuck when you hit those career plateaus? Um, and so all that went into the book um, and I wrote it while working more than full-time hours because we all know engineering jobs are never only 40 hours a week. Uh, with my three, three kids at home, I'm in a dual professional household, uh, also married to an engineer. Um, and this was my quote unquote side project. Um, and I, I put it in quotes because like, I, I didn't have any free time I made it happen because I made it a priority. Uh, and it, I wrote it and published it. And then six months after it was published, um, I resigned from my engineering job to focus on this uh, full time because I, I looked at it and I thought, so for me, one of my things has always been, how do I make the biggest impact in the industry? Uh, and if I'm you know, really honest with myself, yes, I was really good at my technical engineering part of what I was doing. Uh, but there's a lot of really good technical people out there. Um, and, and what I was doing with being able to impact not just like my immediate circle, but far beyond that, I'm like, okay, yeah, this, this is what I want to do. Uh, this is how I can have the biggest impact on the industry long term that I can possibly have. Um, and I also recognize that starting my own company allows me to talk about these issues and tell my stories in a way that I wouldn't be able to do if I was worried about how all of this would reflect on my employer. Um, and I, I, I don't, that actually comes up a lot with, oh, well, other people will be like, I, you know, 
these stories have happened to me too, but I don't want to talk about them because I'm concerned about backlash and things like that. So um, what I do now, I'm, I'm empowering and encouraging, but I'm giving the voice to people who may not feel like they have a voice in their, in their current jobs, in their current positions. Yeah, I think it's so powerful to hear that you were going through all these difficulties as a woman in engineering, and you took that as an opportunity to write this book, even though you didn't have the time. Nobody told you you have to write this book. You took that opportunity to put all that knowledge and honestly, like the courage, because I know a lot of women don't speak out because they're afraid for some reason, which... um it shouldn't happen because they need to call men that are doing the wrong thing. So I think having the, the, the power to write that book, it was amazing and I really enjoyed it. And, um, I know I recommend it to a lot of people because it's, it's a book that is worth reading for both men and women. And so with that, knowing that you were a full-time engineer, how writing this book made you better, like a uh, time management and all these other <laughs> things that I know came came to be when you were writing the book because having three children, I have two children and that's plenty of children in the house <laughs> with an engineering yeah. job and doing all these things. How did you find the time and maybe what what um, strategies did you learn while writing the book? Yeah, so that that is a fabulous question. And I would say the first, the very first thing I learned was that I didn't have a, a time management issue so much as a priority management issue. And that, you know, if this was important to me, I had to make the time to get it done. And so I did things like, you know, got up a half hour early and okay, I got 30 minutes of writing in before I had to get up the kids and get them all dressed and take them off to school and get to work and all of those things. Um, I certainly, you know, talked to my, my family. So I have a partner with my kids, um, about, you know, what was going on, why this was important to me, and enlisted his help to, to help uh, make sure that, okay, take the kids for the park on Saturday so I can focus on writing without interruptions. Um, I did things like take my lunch break and go down to the star Starbucks that was a block from our office. And about half the book got written in that Starbucks. <laughs> um, and, and it was really a matter of like, this is the thing that it is, I feel like is important to me that I need to get out into the world and prioritizing that and learning to say no more often and better <laughs> um, to things that may be important to other people, but weren't on my priority list. Um, and, you know, I, I think the other, the other thing I learned during this time frame was prior to this, I had been a big fan of spending large chunks of time to work on projects. So I felt like, oh, if I can't block off four hours the entire day to work on this one thing, that means I can't make progress. Uh, I'd learned during this time that, that it's actually much better to make it a habit of making consistent projects progress, even if it's only like 15, 30 minutes a day, even if I have to had to dictate my book while standing in the checkout line for the grocery store on like the voice memo and then, you know, put it into one of these translating programs that exist and editing it later. Like it was much better to just make little progress on it every single day by making it a habit than it was to be like, oh, well, I'm just going to block out a weekend every month and do it because then some somehow something would come up. Uh, a work deadline would appear that required a whole bunch of, you know, extra hours, uh, a, a client emergency, because like I said, when I was writing this book, I was a primary client contact for most of my projects. Um, so it wasn't like I couldn't just like not answer my phone mm -hmm. uh, for those sorts of things. Yeah. And I think it's worth noting that at this point in your career, I think you had like 10, 15 years of experience already. So you were in the, in the management yep. position. So it's not like you were a junior engineer or someone just starting their job where you could take some extra time to do all these things and maybe leave your work uh, to the side a little bit. So that's even more impressive. Mm -hmm. And something that I read recently was um, in terms of productivity is kind of, we should try to set maybe an hour to half an hour a day to work on the things that are important, but not urgent. Writing this book wasn't really urgent, yeah. but it was very important for you. And the rest of the day could be set to the things that are urgent and important. Uh, so I think that's something that kind of listening to your story kind of 
came to mind just because you're working on this basically on little chunks of time. And I'm the same like you. I want to set maybe one or two hours maybe to read or mm -hmm. work on other things. But sometimes we just don't have that kind of time or that kind of blocks when you have family, work, and all these things. So yeah. I think that was – it's a great lesson to everyone that is listening to this and want to – um, start a podcast or start a YouTube channel or blogging or anything. Uh, it, it's better to make little progress every now and then than not do it at all. So that's I think that's a great lesson. And and the fact that you were in management and have all these responsibility on the side makes it even more impressive to to have written that book. With that with that being said, one question I have for you is how do you see maybe a younger engineer or someone that is kind of up and coming? How can they improve their engineering skills by having maybe an entrepreneurial mindset of maybe sharing their experiences online, maybe not really starting their own business per se, but having kind of presence online, online like maybe doing a podcast or something like that. How can that, that increase their ability to perform better at their engineering jobs? That is that is a fabulous question. Um, and and I would say like the, the, the first thing it, really does is it kind of forces you to take ownership of full ownership of a project from start to finish. You know, we, we talk about kind of mind, you'll, you'll hear a lot of talk about mindsets in engineering. Um, and I think a lot of folks know like the difference between a, a fixed and a growth mindset in that a fixed one means that you think your, your intellect and your skills are, can't change. Um, and a growth mindset means that they can change, you can learn, you can grow. And I would say, most engineers I've met, and definitely all the successful engineers I've met, have a growth mindset. For the most part, if you made it through engineering school, you have a growth mindset because everybody else dropped out. They didn't make it. But there's a huge difference between having a growth mindset and having an entrepreneurial mindset. And so I, I see the entrepreneurial mindset is it's like the growth mindset when you combine it with like high performance habits and that you're taking complete ownership of this project, whatever it is for you. For me, it started as a book. For some folks, it may start as a blog or a podcast or throwing up your Etsy site to do something online. Um, and I, I first, I want, I I found out after I started my company, there's a whole lot of engineers doing that at this point. Uh, engineers who are working their engineering jobs and, and are doing other things to make sure they can grow in all facets of their uh, skill sets, maybe not just the technical ones. Um, and, and, you know, what, when I talk to them, what comes back is that it makes them better at their jobs. One, because of the level of networking and communication it requires to get something like that off the ground. Uh, you are forced into a position of, I need to reach out via essentially cold email to people I don't know. And, ask them for things to inter be interviewed on my you know, podcast or, th or things like that. Um, and all that, that practice at networking, like I'm an introvert. Mm -hmm. uh, so networking never has come naturally to me, but at this point I have practiced it so much. It doesn't phase me anymore. Um, and networking and all those communication skills, all those soft skills we all hear so much about that we need to get promoted throughout our engineering careers you get those really, really quickly uh, when you have this sort of, you know, side, I'm going to call it a side project or, you know, side hustle, whatever you want to call it. You don't need to, you, you may want to, but you don't necessarily need to go start your own business. And you definitely don't need to be like, oh, well, I have to like quit my engineering job to go start my own, own thing. Um, you know, I am evidence that you, you didn't, you don't need to do that. I mean, it, I wrote and published the book and I was doing that for almost 18 months with the book stuff between writing and publishing um, before I resigned from my engineering job to focus on this. But that was because I wanted to, like, it wasn't like I was forced to, um, it was deciding what I wanted and then going for it. So I would say if they, if your listeners take nothing else from our discussion today, like decide what you want and go do it. Yeah, and I think that's very true. I mean, nobody told me I need to do this podcast and nobody mm -hmm. told you how to write the book. And it just brings joy to me to share this conversation and share kind of my knowledge as a young engineer. I've worked on international projects for over six years now with Engineers Without Borders. 
I've been very active with uh, the Structural Engineering Institute of ASE and, and have been invited to a few committees just because they have seen me either online or at conferences or something. And if that brings me joy, there are other people that like the technical side of engineering and that's all they want to do. And that's perfectly fine because that's what they want to do. Like, I don't think there is a right or wrong answer of what people want to do. Um, something I was curious with you is uh, how, like what challenges did you face when you were like first starting your business? Because it's completely out of the engineering and technical mm -hmm. field. You need to have a completely different mindset in terms of marketing and the, the services and products you're delivering as, uh, as someone that is not working in, in the technical field when you had all these years of experience in structural engineering. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I would say, like, I knew going in that this is going to be a very humbling experience, right? Because I was very good in my technical lane. Um, but I knew, for example, marketing and sales were going to be huge holes. Because I mean, I don't know about you, but I, I never had a marketing or sales, or really a business class in engineering. Um, I did pick some stuff up along the way just by like necessity. Um, but, but all of that was, was a big, a big struggle. Like the thought of talking to someone and being like, well, I, I have these services. Would you like to sign up and like asking people to pay for something like that's a very scary thing. Uh, and I, uh, you know, I've gotten better at it. Is it comfortable yet? No, <laughs> but, uh, but it's, uh, I mean, I have the really cool part about, you know, taking such a very different path is that I have learned so, so very much, um, which is super cool for me. I love to grow, uh, as I imagine a lot of our, a lot of our listeners do. Um, but I would say, so because I knew that was a big hole, um, although it took me a while to come around to the fact that even though as an engineer, I have two degrees, I'm a very smart person, I couldn't actually figure out this business stuff for myself uh, that I needed just like engineers do to go find the right mentors, the right like peer groups, the right support groups to help me along my path. And that is true whether you are starting a business or if you are an engineer at any level that you need those people around you who will, you know, lift you up and support you, give you kind of, you know, third, third party views of what's going on. With, at your firm where you're working, uh, but also can give you kind of career guidance along the way. Yeah, I think that the last thing that you said was very important to hear because I am very young still in, in the engineering profession. So for someone my age, they may think, okay, I don't have enough experience to be a mentor. But in reality, there are students that may be two, three years behind you that you can mentor mm -hmm. and yeah. help them. And I actually have two mentees right now that I'm helping them through like th that career transition between being a student and becoming an engineer, because that's a, again, it's a completely different mindset uh, as you experience kind of in, in your career from engineering to yeah. having your own business. It's, it's, I, I wouldn't say it's similar, but it's, it's close because you're kind of out of your comfort zone. You are now more independent. You have to report to your boss and you have to uh, do all these things that you were not really, um, you weren't really doing when you were a student and, on the other side, I also have mentors that are helping me growing as a young engineer, as I transition into a professional engineer. So there is always room for you, even if you're a student, you're, you're a senior in college, there is a freshman in college that needs help and needs to be mentored. And it's important for especially young engineers to realize that, that they can be mentors. And there's a lot of students that need mentoring, are, are looking for mentor mentorship. So... I think that's also very important to realize that as engineers, we, we are very smart. We know a lot of things, but we also need a lot of help to kind of guide us through our careers. And especially if we're doing like a podcast or a blog, there's different mentors that can help us achieve uh, those, those goals and achieve kind of those things that we want to do. The other, the other thing I was going to ask you is we know engineers are very technical. We know we're very smart. Mm -hmm. We know our key members of, of our society. Why do you think outside people or people outside of engineering or the sciences don't see us that way? 
Are we portraying uh, an, an image that doesn't show that? And how can we maybe turn that around? Yeah, that's an awesome, awesome question as well. Um, so I think, you know, when we think of kind of the, the stereotype of the engineer, um, we usually imagine, or at least like growing up, I imagined, you know, a white dude that kind of looks like Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> I mean, to be, to be a blunt, like with the hoodie and all. Um, and I know I'm kind of aging myself as, because I remember when Facebook wasn't a thing. Um, so, but we have this stereotype of this kind of like quiet person that sits in the corner and, and does their, you know, coding thing or whatever engineering analysis they're doing. Um, and does it maybe necessarily communicate with the world? Um, one of the interesting things about this is that, like, if you look at, for example, like the stereotype of engineers as being introverts, it turns out that uh, in the United States, for example, like uh, a, th a half to a third is the range of people are likely introverts, like they haven't gone out and talked to every single person. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's the estimate. Um, and uh, there's a book called, uh, it's by Susan Cain called Quiet, yep. The Power of Introverts. And in that book, she unravels kind of why there's this like cultural bias specifically in the United States against introverts and, and, and almost to the point that like, in school, we try and we see introverts and we think something is wrong with them. Um, I have had this conversation with my own children because especially for girls, girls are very much socialized to be social creatures. And so when I, I, I had one of my daughters, she's like, well, you know, it's loud at school. There's a lot going on, not in the middle of the pandemic, but when, before we were virtual. Um, and she's like, I feel like something is wrong with me if I just want to sit at recess and read my book or do something quietly. And I had to explain to her that, no, there's nothing wrong with you and that we all need quiet, some, some more than others. Um, but I think, you know, the fact that I think she was in first grade when we had this conversation, the fact that that is ingrained in us all the way up through is part of what contributes to this maybe public perception of engineers as being, you know, only good technically and not maybe the, the quote unquote leadership types. Um, now, once again, I want to emphasize that this is like a US cultural bias because if you go to Asia or Scandinavian countries, uh, it's actually a flip, it's a flip bias. Um, so how do, we over, how do we overcome that? I think that it's really important to first kind of like own who you are so it's tempting when you're an introvert to be like, well, I'm going to make myself be more extroverted uh, because I feel like that's what I have to do to fit in. Um, but in reality, like it, it's better to like own who you are, but then also tell your story. Uh, we were just talking about mentoring a couple minutes ago, and, and I think this is super relevant there too, because like if I tell my story and I only tell you the good parts, the highlight reels that are going to show up on Instagram, you get a false picture of what it means to have an engineering career. Uh, you get a false picture of what it means to like move into a leadership position. But if I tell my story and I'm telling, you know, not just like the highlight reel, but also the parts where I had doubts and struggles and all of those things, like that really, I, I, that has to be a part of leadership because that like humanizes you and gives you the ability to connect with other people. Um, and so I feel like introverts, I like to say like a confident introvert can rule the world because I really do believe that, uh, that when you are kind of like solid and, and this is who I am. And we do have, you know, famous introverts that I'm sure everyone listening has heard of, uh, like Bill Gates, I mean, that, that's, uh, that's a common one. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg, who I talked about earlier, is commonly referred to as, a, as an introvert. There's lots of famous writers, uh, Steven Spielberg, <laughs> who, who is also identified as an introvert. There, there are introverted leaders out there. So I guess don't feel like you have to change yourself because you think that you, you know, we've been fed the cultural BS that uh, extroverts are better than introverts. We all have skills and gifts and talents and how we are really successful in careers and in life and happy while we're doing it is when we lean into what those are for us and stop i like to call it shooting ourselves to death 
in terms of saying I should be doing this and I should be doing that and not looking at, okay, it doesn't matter what you should do. What do you want to do? Uh, and how do you kind of, you know, lean into what you want to do and how you can uniquely serve the world? Because that's the kind of leader the world needs, not the kind of leader that is, you know, just loud for the sake of being loud. And, and I'm not saying that all introverts are loud for the sake of being loud, but we also all know some folks who are like that. Um, the world needs leadership that is thoughtful and, you know, is holding space to listen to other people. And particularly there, I think, is where introverts really, really excel. Yeah, I've talked about quiet, I think, every other episode <laughs> of this year. It's one of my favorite books. <laughs> I read it this year, and it completely changed the way I think of how I operate as an introvert. Obviously, I'm an introvert. Uh, I may not seem like an introvert uh, very recently with the podcast and everything, but I am a huge introvert. I like just have some quiet time. I wake up every morning at 5.30 so I can have an hour and a half of just quiet time around the house without having children jumping off my back and everything. But it's it's fascinating how well written the book is and how well she explains mm. how introverts work and and how our brains work. Being an introvert doesn't really mean like what people think of an introvert being like being quiet and being someone that just likes to sit at the desk and and not talk to anyone at the office. An introvert is more analytical, more uh, tends to process information a little different. And the way we as introverts recharge in a sense is by being quiet and being by ourselves. It doesn't mean that I don't like public speaking or I don't like doing this podcast or socializing or doing all these things. It's just after I do those things, I need maybe an hour of just quiet time just to recharge and do something else by myself because having these conversations, it's very tiring for me. Like every time I finish a podcast, mm -hmm. I'm like, finally, I'm done with the podcast. I just <laughs> want to take a little break now. But during the podcast, it's enjoyable. I'm creating connections. And, I, and as introverts, we like those deep connections rather than having those small talks uh, we see at uh, networking events. So I actually... I hate small talk. <laughs> yeah, I actually had a podcast early on, on on the on this season just talking about how to better network as an introvert. And one of the things I have there is uh, we like to listen more than we are talking. So creating that connection of listening to the other person and understanding where they're coming from and maybe supporting their ideas and then create a deeper connection from, from there. That's what, that's how introverts thrive. And that's how I think networking should be done. You not know, trying to just come and just spill your story and then just leave and, and not have a meaningful, meaningful conversation. So I'm very happy you were the one that brought that book first before I did on this episode uh, because it's a fantastic book. I really enjoyed it and it, it really, really changed my mind of how we operate as introverts. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, one other tip I can share if you are an introvert trying to, you know, work on networking because, you know, I, I feel like a lot of times networking when you're an introvert, it falls into the category of things you know you should do but there's always something that feels more important because you really don't want to do it. <laughs> um, I find that ask, going to things with the intention, you know, whether it be, you know, an interview like this, or, you know, obviously we're doing everything via Zoom or Teams or whatever right now, with the intention of learning about other people. And literally, like, that's my intention in my head. I want to learn about someone. I want to ask them questions and asking lots of questions. Um, that. I think is really, really comfortable for most introverts. It's the whole like talking about yourself thing that starts to be like, I kind of feel like a used car salesperson thing. Um, and so if you have a couple questions in your head, you know, asking people, you know, what are you keeping busy with right now? Or, or, you know, to start the conversation and then just ask them questions on what they said. You'll find you'll have to talk a lot less than you think you might. Um, because, you know, people, particularly now where we are, so starved for connection because you know all of our lives have been completely upended uh, with the pandemic you know people want that connection and even introverts need that connection as well uh, right now so you know on networking you need to do it 
just go for it in a way that's comfortable for you. So for me, volunteering was hands down the easiest way for me to start networking. Um, because while I just mentioned I hate small talk and I really do, when I get in groups, you know, small groups of usually like, you know, nine, 10 people on committees or, or maybe larger working towards a common goal, then it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel like you have to make small talk because you're all working on this little mini project. Um, and so I find, you know, I have most of my network, at least when I started networking, was met through volunteering with various industry organizations. Uh, there are so many advantages to that that I could talk all day on on that. But once again, like if you're if you're an introvert and you're concerned about networking, like the best thing you can do is just go do it. Don't overthink it. Don't keep on planning it to death. I'm a serial planner too. I understand what it is to be like, I'm just going to keep on planning, planning, planning. And I'm not actually going to do anything. It's a really good plan though. Mm -hmm. um, so just get out there and do it. Yeah, I think, and I think that's something I tried to live by because this podcast was in, in planning for over a year and it wasn't really going anywhere. I was kind of planning a little bit, but maybe then I was like, well, is people really going to listen to me? Like, like, what do I have to talk about? Yeah. Is it really going to be interesting? So one day I just decided I'm just going to start. First episode I, that came out, I just recorded it on my phone, on the voice memo, and that's what I published. And it was the worst episode that I could have ever published, but at least I started. And unfortunately, it's been the most popular episode because everyone just wants to hear the first episode. And I'm like, you should listen to the newest ones because those are more interesting. And my point is, it takes practice to become better. And the more you network, the more you speak, the more you do all these things, the better you're going to get at naturally. Like doing it 10, 20, 50 times, you're going to find that if you improve a little bit each time, those little increments really add up really, really quickly. And that's something that I've seen in the podcast. And I hope, hopefully, people that have listened since the beginning have noticed too in terms of the audio quality and the way... I speak and, this, and the way that I formulate the ideas or maybe conduct the interviews, hopefully it's getting better each time I do it because it's practice that I'm, I'm getting in. Um, just moving moving away a little bit from from the introvert topic, which is I could speak forever because it's, <laughs> yeah. it's something that not a lot of people realize or know. It's Every time I talk about the book Quiet, a little, like very few people know that <laughs> book and I just tell them, just, just need, you need to read it. But moving a little bit away from that is... As leaders, as young engineers, um, what skills do we need in order to maybe improve our kind of leadership skills in terms of maybe having better communication, having better um, time management, all these other things that come with becoming a leader. And the way I see leadership is not someone that has power or is the boss in the office. It's someone that can talk to people and influence them and and guide them through a common goal. And the, way, the reason I'm asking you this is because I was recently invited to be a, a member of a task committee for SEI on leadership. I am two years out of college, so I don't see myself as a leader, as, as people commonly think as leaders, but I certainly have build a reputation of someone that is sharing my knowledge, that hopefully is, is sharing the experiences and helping other people achieve their goals. So I'm kind of curious to hear your take on kind of what skills a leader need and and like maybe how what they look like as, as leaders. Okay, so first, I, 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 have, I have to challenge you on this one mm -hmm. because uh, you just said, you know, I'm only a couple years in. I, I don't feel like I'm a leader or I have, you know, I don't feel like I'm a leader, like based on experience level. Um, and, and I am a firm believer that everyone, even if you are a student, can be a leader right where you are. Um, there is someone out there that if you reach them with their, your story, that may cause them to stay in engineering versus quit and go somewhere else. Uh, there is someone out there that, that needs to hear what you have to say. And in, in my mind, the, the biggest traits a leader needs to have is this ability to listen and empathize with other people. 
uh, because I, I completely agree with you when this, this I'm going to call it the old school style of leadership of this like command and control. I have this title, which is higher than yours. So you should do what I say. That is not a leader. Uh, a leader is someone who is able to influence and inspire everyone else on their team towards some sort of goal. And it doesn't have to be a goal like at your office either. It could be like a volunteer goal or, or any other sort of you know project that you might be doing. Um, and so I think a, a leader, there, there are so many skills. Like we could talk for the next several hours a, about this. Um, but I would say like particularly for uh, folks out there who are like, well, I don't have enough experience to be be a leader. Um, like I said, I'm going to challenge you on that. Um, that you can demonstrate, uh, that you can listen, that you can empathize with what others are doing, uh, that you can communicate in a way that you want to be seen in the world. So, like specifically, like owning what you're doing like if you make a mistake okay i made a mistake i'm learning i'm moving on i'm not blaming someone else for what's going on with me like like a, a leader takes ownership of their their path and they do the best they can do with whatever skills they have wherever they have to help lift up and empower the other people they're working with like i think of a leader as kind of like the the light the, the shining light in the darkness uh, in that like you can choose, you can set the intention to show up in the world everywhere you go with, okay, we're going to figure out how to make this work. We're going to figure out how to solve this problem. I'm going to be the, the positive person. And I'm not talking like unicorns and rainbows here either. Like not like rose color glasses that were just completely unrealistic about what's going on. Um, but you can, I mean, we've all had situations at work, for example, where it's it's clearly a conflict laden situation where you know a contractor is coming uh and they're looking for someone to blame and you can be a leader in that situation simply by keeping your calm and continually going back to i hear what you're saying what do you think is a good solution let's brainstorm solutions together um and and that sort of leadership ability especially when you do that over time that adds up to a, an amazingly successful career that, that you will be very proud of down the road. But you can start developing those skills early. And I think that's, you know, all of these leadership skills, like it's not like you get to X, you know, years of experience and all of a sudden you're magically a leader. Like you could, you, you work on these skills over time. And just like the fact that you started, you know, probably well before college, learning your math and science and, and technical skills to get you, you know, into the engineering field to begin with, these leadership skills, you can start where you are and, and learn them as you go. Yeah, I think that's super important. And I, I said I'm not a leader in, in the common sense of how people see leaders, but I do see myself as someone that has maybe a little bit of influence and maybe I'm showing my experiences and hopefully helping other people like through this podcast and through all yeah. the things that I'm doing as well as I think you mentioned this uh, maybe a couple of questions ago is showing more of the struggles rather than the successes and maybe have a little more yeah. balance and, and show that, like I said, the, have, doing this podcast is not easy and having this conversation is not no. really easy. It takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of um, control, not like control. It takes a lot of motivation to do these things mm -hmm. because yeah. as an introvert, I would rather be maybe laying in bed reading a book right now but we both would be exactly but we're here and we're having this conversation so that other people know that they aren't alone they're not the only one who's who has struggled with these issues they're not the only one sitting there like what do you mean i'm gonna have to wait 20 years to get promoted to be in a leadership position like uh, if you're that person know you're not alone and that you know uh, people like us are are having this conversation just for you, although we would rather be doing something <laughs> else. Like if we look at what we would naturally rather be doing, right? Uh, we're we're here for you. So yeah, and I think that's something I have heard from so many people doing the same things. Uh, they're introverts and they're posting views on YouTube, having a podcast or a blog, or volunteering with organizations. And even though they're young and maybe they will be, try to be doing other things, they're doing 
these things because they're passionate about helping others and showing that in my case, I'm, I'm a Latino immigrant showing that Latinos can be an engineer and can be a, can be leaders in a society like the U.S. and with everything that's going on, even though I'd rather be doing other things. And I'm, I'm just happy to have this conversation with you just because I know there's a lot of people that needs to hear these conversations more. So, um, yeah, I just, <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's kind of hard to put into words how I feel about people that think that doing all of these comes natural to me and for you and for other people. And, and I think it's just very happy to hear that it's not easy and it takes a lot of time. And as leaders, we are always looking to improve ourselves. I'm sure I am just a couple of years out of, out of college and I'm still learning how to become maybe a better leader. And there may be someone that is 30 or maybe even 40 years out of college that still figure out how to become better leaders. So it's not like, okay, I have 10 years of experience. I am a leader now. What's next? It's always something that needs to be improving like year after year. And it's something that we need to keep working as young engineers and as more experienced engineers. So know that one, you're not alone. And two, it's a long road to leadership and to accomplishing goals in general, I think. Uh, so one of the last few questions I have for you is what common mistakes do you see engineers do, especially kind of early on in their careers? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I love this question because I would say like the, the first thing I see a lot of is that we frame mistakes as mistakes instead of learning experiences. And so I can give you an example of this from like just yesterday. I was, I was talking to one of the women in my programs um, and she had had a, an experience where she had turned something into her manager and she thought it was done, but her manager didn't think it was done. And when I asked her about this, she's like, well, I just, I just, I didn't know what I didn't know. Like I, I didn't know to ask the right question. And, and, she sat with me on our call together and was beating herself up over the fact that she didn't know what she didn't know. Um, and I know I have, I did this a ton when I first started out. Like I had this idea that, you know, like it, when you were in university that you had to get, you know, you wanted to get the A's, you had to get the hundred on the test, that there was somehow you, you had to get your work done perfectly. Um, and instead of looking at it as, okay, like you're still learning, you, you're going to make mistakes. I set the expectation for myself, as I know a lot of engineers do as high achievers that, okay, it has to be right, 100% right all the time. And then I would beat myself up when it wasn't right. Um, and, and why that is, is such a problem when you're a young engineer is because then what happens is like you're you're basically kind of draining your own confidence um, and keeping yourself from like going for opportunities that might be perfect for you um, and so i would say like that the the idea of when you make a mistake first you're going to make mistakes and learning from those mistakes and not kind of dwelling in the fact that, yeah, you made a mistake. I wish I had done that differently. Like we can all get stuck in that cycle of rumination about all these things I wished I had, uh, I know I'll do it. All these things I wish I had said differently because like in the moment, sometimes, especially as an introvert, you're like still processing what's going on. And then you leave and you're like, oh man, I wish I had a good comeback for that. And I, I missed it. So um, and, and that, <laughs> that kind of like, living in what you did in the past instead of focusing on like what's what's ahead of you um, that's something i did often um, and and it's something i see from a lot of the engineers i coach i want to share one other kind of mistake that i see often and this is the idea that we we often artificially limit our options um, so i would say the vast majority of women in engineering specifically that come to me are in a spot where they're like stuck in their careers and they're not sure what to do next. And when we talk through like, okay, like tell me what has happened so far. Some common things I will hear is, okay, I picked this major. I got my first job. I didn't like it. And now I think I should go back to school. Or um, I, 
I tried, you know, two jobs in my field and, and this field, is, I don't like this field. And I went and looked for other jobs, but there wasn't anything open that I wanted. And we, like, we, we make it so that we're only looking at what other people say our options are instead of doing the hard work of sitting down and figuring out what we want. Um, and it's okay to not know what you want. That's the other thing. Like throughout this process, it's okay to not know what you want. Um, but like one of the things I will commonly suggest in all of these situations is to go to find people whose jobs look interesting and go talk to them. Um, ask them what they like, what they don't like, what their what their day-to-day -day experience is. Um, and, and do that before you do anything else. Uh, I was talking to a woman yesterday who's like, you just saved me like $50,000 or more from going back to school because of that suggestion. But it all comes back to this like idea that we artificially limit our options to what we see out there as available, which is very different from sitting down and figuring out, okay, like, what do I think I want to do at this moment in time? It doesn't have to be forever. It doesn't have to be like, I'm a big fan of planning, but when you're starting out, you don't have to have a 20 year plan. You have to have like a next year plan and your next year plan the year after that can change. If you aren't, you know, if a new job doesn't work out, if a new rule doesn't work out, you can change your plan. But the first step is always going to be to sit down and figure out what you want, not look outside of yourself for what options are available to you. That is so true. And I really resonate with that first advice you gave of like, don't be afraid to make mistakes. I think I, I have talked about this so much whenever I interview for other things or doing presentation and everything. And I think we in school are taught that we need to be perfect and that we need to find yeah. the right answer. When in reality, engineering as a whole is a very empirical profession. Like we learn from people that came before us on how like the formulas that we see in our in our books and everything is not like okay you find that formula okay you find exactly the amount of stress that that beam has that's never true like you there's certain margin of error there that we need to understand and, and there's you're never going to find the right answer on the first try and as engineers we need as a, especially young engineers we need to realize that when we come out of school we are thought that we need to be perfect and then we need to get a hundred in exams we need to get a hundred in, in the homeworks. Mm -hmm. But when you start working, there's so many different ways to solve the same problem yeah. that you need a little bit of guidance to navigate those problems. And that's why we have a supervisor. That's why we have more senior engineers to help you walk through the problems. And it's also very important to both ask questions and ask the right questions when you're coming to your supervisor. They don't really have time to be sitting there with you giving you an explanation of everything, every single calculation, everything. They're they're very busy, and, and that's why, as young engineers, we need to realize that both we'll be ma making mistakes, but the more proactive we are of finding our or our, the answers by ourselves or maybe a little uh, guidance on how to answer a problem or something before we go to our supervisor, it's, it's key, and that's something that I've seen time over time in my own experiences and talking to people and talking to more senior engineers is, yes, you're going to be making mistakes, but that's why we have supervisors and that's why we need to learn from them. Um, on the second side, I think it's, it's very important for young engineers to understand that changing careers is not the end of the world. I've had, I think I counted like five different jobs in the last seven years. <laughs> and it's not like I didn't like the job and I'm going to move on, which still, okay, you're still experimenting on seeing what field of engineering you are more passionate about. And there is time to switch jobs early on in your career and actually switch from buildings to bridges, which is completely different design. <laughs> yeah. And it's a completely different world, but because both I'm still fairly early on my career and second, I am very proactive and I like to kind of take initiative in learning and everything, the transition hasn't been that hard. Um, granted, I had a little bit of experience in doing grad school, but it's okay to make those transitions and it's okay to maybe, if you want to take a year and find a job that you may like in the future, it's okay to take those breaks and understand um, what's going to be the best career path. You have a lot of years after you graduate to, to leave your your passion, your career and everything. So it's okay to take a few years kind of early on to figure out what that 
uh, perfect career for you is. Uh, the last question I have for you, Stephanie, you are very knowledgeable, very active in the career, which has been great. We've been able to collaborate in a few activities and everything. And I'm, I'm very happy that we connected when we did is how can we continue engineering our future? That's, this is such a big, big question. I was excited to talk about this question because you ask it on every single episode. Um, but I, I think the, the biggest thing about engineering our future is realizing that engineering isn't only about the technical stuff. And I know you talk about that a lot to your listeners, but I, I feel like even more so kind of moving forward with the advances in AI and the advances with machine learning, that when you're like engineers, we are super smart. We have a lot of abilities to synthesize data and knowledge that, that other professions may not have. And so though, although we have not been traditionally leaders kind of in the public eye, we certainly have the ability to do so but only if we are kind of able to understand like the big picture part of where our engineering design fits into like the financial and business and, and cultural parts of what we're doing. Because at its core, like I feel like most people, including myself, went into engineering predominantly because we love the technical part. We like the math and science. We were usually pretty good at it. <laughs> Uh, all the way through school, and that's why we came. But engineering, like it, we are serving people. Like we are providing green or clean drinking water. Um, I have an engineering friend. She's like, we designed an app so that when there's a like a disaster, so a hurricane or something, they can locate people, like locate where the different people are. Uh, we have, you know obvious things like our phones and, and things like that but all of our engineering designs like have to fit within the within the context of our broader society so i think the more we understand that the more we incorporate that into our designs the better designs we create and in order to do that we really have got to get better at the whole kind of people leadership stuff that we've been talking about and that includes but is far from limited to making sure that those everyone that's everyone can see that it's not only possible to be an engineer but like our engineering community is as diverse as the communities we are designing for um and you know diversity and inclusion is a huge thing of mine as well we're not gonna have time to talk a lot about that today but i, I think that like that is critically important to be able to engineering not just our future, but the future of the world. Yeah, and it's funny because, yeah, I ask this question at the end of each episode, and I am always blown away by the, the like all the different answers that I've been getting for the past uh, six, seven months now. And it's always interesting to both hear the perspective of the person I'm interviewing as well as um, just hearing both knowing the, like, a little bit of their background, where they're coming from, and how they, they see the concept of engineering our future. And I, I don't think engineering our future only means that engineers are engineering our future. It also means that as a society, we're all working towards the same goal of just better ourselves and find new technologies and find new ways to do the same things we've been doing for years. So uh, thank you so much for coming to the podcast. It's been a pleasure to get to know you a little bit better here on the on the show and just through all the things we've been doing together. Uh, for people that are listening and watching to this, where can they reach out to you and find you? Yeah, so you can, uh, my website is engineersrising.com. I would also encourage, and, and on that website, we have lots of free resources, lots of blogs, um, a lot of engineering career related stuff as you would imagine. Uh, and I would also encourage everyone to reach out to me on LinkedIn. You'll find me, I am Stephanie Slocum, PE. Uh, I'm a pretty open networker, especially when it comes to other engineers. Uh, so I'd encourage everyone to reach out to me there as well. Uh, if you have like a specific question, like I often will mentor engineers, just connect with me on LinkedIn, message me and we'll, we'll go from there.
Yeah, yeah, that's great. I know a few people actually that have had here on the podcast uh, have reached out to you. They they told me that um, they reach out to you and you help them out. So that's great to hear as well as just show that you are always open to listen yeah. to new people and give them advice. So again, thank you so much for all you're doing in engineering, helping other women in engineering and for all the great things you're doing for our profession. I, I appreciate and thank you for having me. And I, I also just want to say I'm a big fan of what you're doing with your podcast and, and the, the courage it takes to put this out into the world. Yeah, thank you. There you have it. That's, that's today's conversation with Stephanie. She has a lot of great things to say, a lot of great lessons to teach us. And it was great to just pick her brain about all these things that I am personally very curious about as I navigate basically this podcast and all the things that I'm doing outside of work, my volunteering with the ASC, SEI, and, and EWB, and just how to kind of develop that entrepreneurial mindset that even though I'm not really looking to leave my job and start something else, it will help me become a better engineer, it will help me become a better manager in the future, and it's going to help me a lot in my career. So hopefully you guys found a lot of value in this episode. Thanks so much for listening and make sure you subscribe for future episodes. Uh, we're growing tremendously and it's it's happy. I am very happy to just see how everyone is very, it's been really well receptive about these recent episodes. Um, as you may have noticed, this year we've been doing episode weekly, which is a, a great experience um, as well as challenging because I'm, I'm having to record a lot more often and putting content out there uh, more often. So Hopefully you guys enjoying more content from me, more interviews, more solo episodes and doing all these great things with the podcast and make sure if you are enjoying the episodes, share with someone that you know, share with on social media, tag me, tag Stephanie. She's always open to receive questions and answer them and, and just connect with her. She's someone that is always open to just help other engineers in their careers and make sure you rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts. It really helps get the word out there. And again, as I said, we've been growing week after week, which is very encouraging. I am very happy where we're heading. I'm very happy where this podcast is going and it's all thanks to you. And remember that this podcast is for you. So if you have any questions, any requests, anything, just let me know. Send me an email. Uh, you can contact me through the website or you can actually just text me at 605-549-5179. And I'm happy to connect with you. Leave me a voicemail if you want. A lot of options to contact me and I'm always open to receive your feedback. With that being said, I'll talk to you in the next one. But for now, let's continue engineering our future.